First is John chapter 1, verse 14, sets the context for our time together. It says, Jesus, he came, and when he came, he was full of grace and truth. Was he half of each? No, he was full of grace and he was full of truth. He was full of truth and he was full of grace. And so he is the only one who's ever been able to perfectly manage both of those. 100% honest and 100% gracious, 100% full of love. He didn't sacrifice one when he was exhibiting the characteristic of the other. God is describing through this passage how much work and effort and intricate detail that goes in to every person that is ever created. I know you might know this intellectually, but let it sink down into your heart today. Of the 8 billion people on the planet, there is no one even close to you. There never has been anyone designed as detailed and uniquely as you, and there never will be in the future. Thank you. You may be seated and welcome. My name is Kyle. I'm the pastor here and had a chance to greet a number of you on your way in if I didn't meet you, I hope to do so after service. I'll be down front here and happy to answer any questions that you may have. After last week's message, had a number of people reach out and wanted to have coffee and ask questions and clarify some things, and I'm sure that'll be true after this week as well. So feel free to, to do that. Reach out and we'd love to, to have coffee with, uh, with most of you anyway. Just, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Making friends already. Um, we are in this series called Jesus And. Uh, typically at Boulder Mountain, we take a text of scripture, a book of the Bible, a chapter or passage, and we'll walk through it. For a few weeks, we're looking at some cultural topics, issues, and asking how does a follower of Jesus address each one of these from a, from a biblical perspective. And so as we do that, I'm going to ask for grace. This is a topic that we cannot address in 30 minutes. Uh, there's a lot of nuances and, and, and things. We're gonna, so I'm going to ask for grace on this. And we're going to look at a couple passages, see what God has to say on this subject. The first is John chapter 1, verse 14. sets the context for our time together. It says, Jesus, he came, and when he came, he was full of grace and truth. Was he half of each? No, he was full of grace and he was full of truth. He was full of truth and he was full of grace. And so he is the only one who's ever been able to perfectly manage both of those. 100% honest and 100% gracious. 100% full of love. He didn't sacrifice one when he was exhibiting the characteristic of the other. You and I feel that tension. And sometimes there's a room this size, there's about half of you are truth tellers and the other half of you are grace givers. And you know who you are. And so you have to be intentional on that other side to make sure that when you approach a situation and a topic like this, that you bring both buckets full of grace and full of truth. John 1, 14. Jesus came full of truth and full of, of grace. And so as we approach this topic, we bring truth and we bring, we bring grace. You'll never find more grace in your life than you'll find in the person of Jesus. You'll never find more truth in your life, someone to shine light in dark places than you'll find in the person of Jesus. And that we're grateful for. There's a number of passages of scripture that address life. At Boulder Mountain, we believe and support life. <clears throat> When we come to a topic like this, we have to be informed that no place does the Bible directly speak about the subject and the topic of abortion. We have to, we have to admit that. Sometimes in hard topics and issues of society, we, we read into the text, but taking the text at face value, nowhere does the Bible speak. And so when that happens, when we come to a topic or an issue that the Bible does not speak directly about, we need to go to the places surrounding that topic. 
it can help us understand how to think through these things by going to the closest passages that address that topic. So let me give you an example. The Bible never tells us to do not kidnap people, but I'm pretty sure God's not about us kidnapping people. Are you tracking with me? Maybe. I've already lost half the room. <laughs> and so to argue that because the Bible doesn't talk about abortion, then it must be okay. That's an argument from absence. And that's not what we're to do when it comes to scripture. So what are the passages that speak around the subject? Psalm 139, many of you are like, I knew that's where he was gonna go today. It was written by David. When David wrote this passage, he wasn't addressing the topic of abortion, but he was through the power of the Holy Spirit who gave him the words to address in this text, inspired. Now the Bible is not a science book, but when the Bible speaks on science, guess what? It's always accurate. The Bible's not a math book, but when the Bible speaks on math, it's accurate. The same is true with history. Put in the subject, the Bible is not that book, but when it speaks to those things, it's, it's accurate. So this is written thousands of years ago by King David. What do we know about David? David lost a child at birth. David understands what it's like to lose a child. And we have the promise of God. And let me just start here today as we address this topic of abortion with grace and with truth. There's a promise that David holds on to in scripture that he says, I will see my child again one day in heaven. The Roe v. Wade decision occurred around the time I was born, about the same month I was born, about 51 years ago. And it's estimated data is hard to track when it comes to abortions in the United States, but it's around 100 million, 100 million. I believe that those 100 million children will be in heaven. I believe that's what the Bible teaches. David says, I will see my child again one day in heaven. We're going to see 100 million children who never took their breath outside the womb. We're going to see them in heaven. And we're going to see how we got there from David's writings here in Psalm 139. Verse 13, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16. We walk through this passage and we see that the word formed, there's a number of verbs in this, this text. If you have colored pencils or highlighters, however you do your Bible study, you can have some fun with this. But underline the word, God, what's God doing? God is active. He is at work. God, there's a lot of verbs in this passage. He's forming. He's knitting. Right? He's creating. He's weaving talks about the frame. So you have this idea of a form and a frame. For you formed, in Hebrew, this, this idea of a fence. What's, what's David describing here? He's describing a home. Now, if you've ever read through the Bible, maybe you had a commitment on January 1st one year, you're going to read through the Bible this year. For the first time ever, you're going to read through the Bible, and it starts off great. The story of Adam and Eve and Noah's Ark. I mean, there's some great stories in Genesis. And then you get to Exodus and Leviticus, and that's where Bible reading plans go to die. <laughs> and you give it up. By February, you're like, I'll try it again next year, okay? Why? Because you get into some really intricate details of God's instruction to his people about building things like the tabernacle. All these Rules and laws and instructions. I mean, you think Ikea instructions were difficult. Read through Exodus and Leviticus on how to build a tabernacle for God. He's so detailed. Talking about the threads that are woven together. 
take three threads and then you add a fourth one. It should be of this color and the wood that holding up the, t the, the curtain should be four feet by six feet and detail after detail after detail. Now, why is that so important? You're like, Kyle, what's this have to do with the topic? Because God was describing how important it was the home that he was going to dwell in in the Old Testament. It was important. This is where I'm going to dwell and where I'm going to live. This is important. You have to get this right. Don't cut corners on this. God's a God of, of detail. And so what's, what's, what's happening here? God is describing through this passage how much work and effort and intricate detail that goes in to every person that is ever created. I know you might know this intellectually, but let it sink down into your heart today. Of the 8 billion people on the planet, there is no one even close to you. There never has been anyone designed as detailed and uniquely as you, and there never will be in the future. We've come to know a lot about DNA the last 20 or so years, and it's fascinating. Scientists continue to be baffled by DNA. For you are formed, this, this fence idea, by my inward parts. In Hebrew, it's talking about the guts, all the organs, and the, specifically the kidneys. He's saying, God, you made my kidneys. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You are fearfully, you are wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. He's talking about skeleton, and, and, but more than that, there's something else happening in this passage that uh, as English readers, we can miss. But you get into the original language. There's something else happening here. There's more going on than just God creating a body, a skeleton, and a frame. There's more happening in this passage. You and I, we can say, yeah, God created me, but what else is happening? You were created. What also God is doing in this moment, in this passage, is he's giving each person a purpose. Not just a body, but God is creating that body to have a specific purpose here on, here on earth. Intricately woven in the depths of the earth. There's a, there's a word that we don't use very often in English, but it's the best word to be translated here. That's variegate. Anybody use that word on a daily basis? Variegate. What does variegate mean? It means as if when God is intricately weaving us together, he's giving you a color that's never been seen before. Of the 8 billion people on the planet right now, imagine a bag of M&Ms of 8 billion different colors. That is what variegate means here. And the author saying every person that's woven together is woven for a very specific, unique purpose, a color that you and I have never even seen before. God is giving this person, as he's working and weaving this body together with a specific purpose that, that's never been created before. And God does that with every child that is conceived. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. The word there is the, for unformed substance is, is golem. Does that ring a bell? Lord of the Rings, golem. I don't know if that's where J.R. Tolkien got it from, but ancient Jewish werewolf or vampire story. My eyes saw my unformed substance. What David is, is drawing from in the Hebrew history is Adam and Eve. What did God do with Adam and Eve? He took nothing and created something. That's what God does with all of us. God created Adam and Eve out of the dirt of the ground, out of the rib of Adam. He creates Eve. He does that, and then he breathes the life. He breathes life into them and gives them, gives them life. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me. Your days are numbered. Not only are they numbered and known by God, they're written down. God knows every detail. He knows the date where your life's going to end, and only God gets to decide the day you're born, the day that you end. 
And this could be Jesus and, it's abortion today. It could be Jesus and suicide. It could be Jesus and euthanasia. The principle is the same. Life is valuable because it comes and originates from God. God creates life. And God has the authority to take life as well. The days that were formed for me. Now, I want you to listen. look at this in verse 16. When as yet there was none of them. When I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah 1, verse 5, he talks about, I was set apart in the womb to be a prophet to the nations. Before I formed you, I knew you. I set you apart. It's an incredible passage of your uniqueness and the beauty in which you were, you were made, the wonderful place, the sacred place where God resides. I talked about the tabernacle. Now, why is it so important how God forms you? Because God is creating a place, ultimately, when he weaves a child together in the womb, what is he doing? He's ultimately creating a place for him to dwell. In the Old Testament, he dwelled in tabernacles and tents made by hands. But in these days, my Christian follower of Jesus, the home for God is you. You are intricately woven to be a vessel for God himself to place himself into one day. It's a sacred place where God resigns. Now at the end of that passage, he talks about the number of days. And I want you to know before, before one of them before that child took their first breath, God already knew their purpose. The days or lack of days were recorded in his book. It says here in Psalm, for the child that was aborted had a purpose. And I believe we'll see them one day in heaven. God knew them, saw them. I think of a passage in Luke chapter 1, verse 44. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, walk into a room together. It sounds like a joke starting. But the two of them are in the same room. And what happens when Mary walks into the room, who is impregnated with Jesus, John the Baptist, who is in the womb of Elizabeth, does a cartwheel in the womb. John the Baptist's purpose was to be the forerunner to Jesus, the point to say, Jesus is here. And he starts in the womb. When Jesus walks in the room, John's like, hey, I'm not going to wait. Let's get going right now. I'm going to let my mother know, Elizabeth, that the Messiah is here. He does a cartwheel in the womb. Mothers, you know what that's like. The child in the womb can hear. The child in the womb can see. A child in the womb can know voices. I, I know when we, we were pregnant, when my wife was pregnant, that would know my voice. You could speak to the child. And they would respond and kick. And they don't do that anymore. They don't respond when I speak. But they, <laughs> they did when they were in the womb, right? It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. But in this day and age, in our culture, the truth when the truth is spoken, it will be contested at every turn, everywhere, always. And so as we approach this topic, we approach it with truth and with grace. And it is undeniable all through Scripture the value of life that God places on his people. Life has great value. The very first person to recognize Jesus as the Messiah, the very first worship of Jesus comes from an unborn baby. Are you kidding me? There's Jesus. He hadn't even taken his first breath yet. You see that in scripture. So how do we approach this topic? The truth is that life begins at conception. Science will not argue that. That is all throughout Scripture. The truth is how most abortions occur. 
around 80% of them occur. Finding a couple, every time there's a woman struggling with this decision, there is also a man involved. That's how that works. And so let's not forget the men involved. There are either men who are pressuring a woman to make this decision, or there are men who do not agree with this decision that is being made. But 80% of these happen outside the context of marriage. And so I know I'm going to speak a foreign language in this room, but for those of you who consider yourself pro-life, you cannot also endorse a wildly, wildly sexualized culture that celebrates and allows sex outside the confines of marriage. I know I'm speaking a foreign language here. Paul writes, because of the temptation to sexual immorality, fornication, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. In other words, God made sex for the beautiful covenant relationship of commitment called marriage. And for those of you who are single, I encourage you to pursue that and that you would wait and that you would celebrate purity in your life, that God has given us sex. It's a wonderful thing within the confines of, of marriage. If you are married, then you have the opportunity to have sex for the rest of your life with one person, right? Amen? Not two or more, for one. As the clarity of Scripture, God is really clear on that. As the teachings all throughout Scripture, that sex is reserved for the confines of marriage. When we go outside of that, Listen, there's grace, there's forgiveness, and we're going to talk about that here today. But when we go outside the bounds that God has designed and planned for us, things get really complicated. and We find ourselves wrestling with really difficult things like abortion. About 1% of the cases are rape, but 99% of the cases. And let me just say to any woman or man who finds himself in this situation, it is never wrong to do the right thing. Doing the right thing will never ruin your life. It does not mean your life may not be more difficult, but doing the right thing will never ruin your life. So as a follower of Jesus, how do we approach this topic? We come along, and many of us in this room, if we personally have not wrestled with this, we definitely have friends or family members or coworkers or neighbors who are wrestling with this. It's still one of the taboo subjects, even within the church. We keep it a secret and we don't talk about it and we carry it around with great shame. And how do we respond? We, we come a, a, upon somebody as a follower of Jesus and we say to them, I see you, I empathize with you, and I'm here to help you. Any other response is to not show the compassion of Jesus. To name call, either in person or at a picket line, or to shove a sign in somebody's face, or to write something online, is to be less compassionate than Jesus ever was. I came into the office one day when I was on staff at a church. I wasn't there very long, and a young woman walked down the hallway, and she came into my office. She knocked on my door, came to my office, shut the door. She turns around from the door, and she's weeping. This was a woman on staff at the church. She said, I'm pregnant, I can't tell my parents, and I don't know what to do. I see you, I have empathy for you, I'm here to help you. That is the response of Jesus. And if anybody has an opportunity to influence somebody who finds himself in the position, if you are pro-life and you believe in the value of life all through Scripture, then you also have to believe in the fruit of the Spirit of Galatians chapter 5 which says that as followers of Jesus, we are to show love and compassion and patience and joy. You don't get to decide which scripture you're going to follow. And so you stand on truth. You don't sacrifice truth. But you also show grace and compassion. And you say, I'm, I'm here to help you. I'm so grateful my parents were at strong convictions Strong convictions don't give you the right to treat people however you want to treat them. Legislation is not going to change hearts on this topic. Vote, vote your convictions, but just because you have a strong stance on a certain topic 
never gives you the right to demean somebody or to treat them in a way that Jesus would have treated them. There's two interactions I see in Scripture where Jesus has that closely relate to this topic. Again, it's not the topic of abortion. But there's a woman caught in adultery, and she's dragged out to Jesus. And everybody wants to condemn her and point their fingers at her and kill her. And Jesus says, I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. I do not condemn you is the grace. And so best I have for you today, you are not condemned. The truth is, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. I do not condemn you. Both are true. As Christians, sometimes we want to live in the either or. Either this is true or that is true. But it, when it comes to grace and truth, we live in the both and. It makes life more difficult living in the both and. It would be easier to just pick a side. But as a follower of Jesus, you don't get to pick a side. You don't sacrifice truth to be gracious. You don't sacrifice grace just for truth. And so different generations in the room, the beauty of Boulder Mountain is we're an intergenerational church, right? Different generations. And so to those who have strong convictions on this, this topic, let me encourage you to not name call. You don't throw words around like baby killers. Do you really think that's going to help lead somebody to Jesus by calling them names? Would you want to be called adulterer or gossiper or drunk? I don't think so. So let's not get to pick and choose. Some of us are upset because people sin differently than you do. We don't get to decide that. We all are sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. And we all are in need of a Savior. And one sin is not worse than another one. And we all are in need of grace and truth. Grace and truth. And so what does compassion look like? I'm grateful for my parents who had children, babies in and out of our home when we were growing up. Uh, a couple dozen infants came in and out of our home. Two never left, and they became my brother and my sister. My wife and I had an opportunity to be foster parents for a number of years, and uh, it's hard. But here's what I know. The government makes a really awful parent. And some of you might feel called to open up your home to a, to a child for a short season to show them, that mother, the grace and the compassion in the child as well. It's not easy. I know there's a myth out there that says, well, I wish Christians were just as concerned about the child after birth as they are before birth. Well, that is a myth because nobody fosters more than Christians. Nobody is involved in adoption more than Christians. No one is more involved in caring for children in our country than followers of Jesus. You walk into any city in our country, you will find a crisis pregnancy center and they're run by Christian women who are giving their life to say to other women who find themselves in difficult spots, I see you, I empathize with you, and I'm here to help you. I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to put my arm around you and let's, let me help you. Outside today, before services, we had an organization called Choices. It's a Christian pregnancy center opening up in Mesa. They have a number of them around the Phoenix Valley. There's an open house the first Saturday of November. You can grab more information if you want to be involved, if you want to help with that. I find it interesting, but I just wanted to break that myth. Christians are involved. There wouldn't be schools if it weren't for Christians. There wouldn't be hospitals if it weren't for Christians. Food banks. You don't hear of the first atheist food bank down the street, do you? You hear of fishes and loaves and harvest food banks. I mean, they're Christians make society better and meet needs, meet needs head on. And so we are to have compassion for those who find themselves. I've never been in that situation, scared, alone feeling like if I tell anyone I'm going to be judged and I'm going to bring shame onto my family. I've never been in that situation. Maybe some of you have. But there is good news for all of us in the room today. I want to share a testimony that a friend of mine, her name is Elaine, turn your attention to the screen as we hear her testimony today.
Boulder Mountain, it's a privilege to have a friend of mine share her story today as we go through the Jesus and series, specifically this weekend, Jesus and abortion. And Elaine, it takes a tremendous amount of courage to share your story, not just with me, but with the entire church at at Boulder Mountain. So uh, thank you for being willing to share and tell a little bit about your background and, and what God's done in your life. Yes, thank you so much for having me. My name is Elaine Larison. I'm a family practitioner and I live and work in Mesa, Arizona. I'm originally from New Jersey, um, then went to Colorado and been here for almost 10 years. My background um, with um, abortion um, came a couple years ago when I actually found a um, program called Surrendering the Secret by Pat Latham. Um, and that does help women who have had abortions to heal from a God stand. And knowing that God has forgiven me and that I needed to forgive myself. My story starts way back when I was young and being molested um, by family members. And uh, at age 14, I had a family member's uh, friend who um, raped me and I got pregnant. And I went to my mom, um, who was not a very loving mother, and uh, told her what had happened. And she said, boys will be boys. And she said, you will have an abortion. And uh, she took me down to have one. And when we came home, nothing was said and um, just went on with life. And then at age 17, I started dating this guy in high school. And he kept asking me to be intimate. And I was like, no, you know, I did not want anything to do with that. Um, and uh, he then forced me to, um, to have sex. And I got pregnant again, and I told my mom. And again, I was forced to have an abortion. And then at age 19, I met this guy who I thought we were gonna marry. Um, I had just finished high school, I was going into college, and um, you know, we were gonna wait till we got married. And one thing led to another, and I got pregnant. And I did not tell my mother because I knew that she then would make me have another abortion. And so I told his mom and his mom said, well, I had an abortion and you're going to have one. You're not going to ruin my son's life. Mm. And that was very hard. You so know? at 19, you've had three abortions. Correct. Okay. And just recently, you said a couple of years ago, you went through surrendering the secret mm -hmm. for the first time. Yes. So tell me what, what occurred all those years from the time you were 19 what were you feeling? What were you carrying around? What? How were you processing through all that? I just just dug it deep inside, and I then had issues with relationships, with jobs, with anger and anxiety. Couldn't sleep. Um, I drank. I did things that just trying to numb these feelings because I knew as a Christian that it was not right. But then I also was like, well. You know, God, I've asked for forgiveness and God, it says that God will forgive you, ask for it, but I didn't forgive myself. Mm. And when I heard Pat's story and what it was about, you know, at first I thought, well, let me take the class. And so then I can help other women because as a family practitioner, that's what I do. I help people not knowing that I actually needed the healing mm -hmm. and it's an eight week class that, um, goes into depth. There's a lot of, um, there's homework to do. There's good weeks, bad weeks. I mean, there's all different things and there's all support with women. It's very confidential. Um, and my husband kept asking me, tell me about the class, tell me about the class. And I was like, I can't tell you. And he was like, why? It's, you're not doing anything with patients. It's not HIPAA or anything. So finally, uh, after week six of eight weeks, I told him. He didn't know. He had no clue. He just knew you were going to a group. Yep. And we had been married almost 20 years. Okay. 20 years. 20 years. And him and I had three miscarriages through our marriage. And I, each time with my miscarriage, I thought it was God taking one for one. Because mm -hmm. I had an abor abortion. Then I had, you know, with him, three miscarriages. So one for one. But I know God does not work that no. way. No. Um, God, God does not keep a little score or anything. Um, and so I know that God uses everything for his glory, um, for sure. And so um, I 
told him, you know, at age 14, this at age 17, this and 19, this. And he just looked at me like, wow, you've had three abortions. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes. And he said, I am so sorry. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was awesome going through this program because I was able to find forgiveness in myself. I was able to forgive the people who made me have the abortions and the medical people, the doctors, the nurses, my ex-boyfriends, my mom, my ex-boyfriend's mom. Like I was able to, we write letters and that's one of the best things as you're writing and studies have shown pen to paper really gets everything out and you don't reread it because you're just putting that back in. And instead what we do is we just burn it mm -hmm. and you watching all your hurt just goes up in flames and you're like, Oh my gosh. And so it doesn't just impact you. No decisions. There's a whole network of people who are impacted by this. Yeah. Yep. Everybody. Um, and I can think back of from, being young all the way up on how it affected. Yeah. And I'm 53 now and only in the last couple of years have I actually have found what true love is. And that is through God. What would you say Elaine to a young woman who may be in the same spot that you were in a number of years ago, you know, scared. Um, she has people telling her what to do and, and she's feeling alone. What would you say? to her, whether it's at Boulder Mountain or somebody watching this online? So what I would say to you um, is that you're not alone and God loves you and you are forgiven. And that I really highly recommend for you to take the Surrendering the Secret class to find that healing and that love mm -hmm. and to find peace. And that we are always there for you and you're never alone. Yeah, thank you. The, the gospel says that uh, when Jesus redeems us, not only does he forgive our sin, but he atones our sin, meaning he doesn't even remember it. It's, it's removed from his memory. That's difficult for us to do, right? Mm -hmm. But in terms of relationship with God, he no longer remembers it and holds that, holds that against us. And, uh, you know, we all can relate. Mm -hmm. to regret and shame and uh, thank goodness for the gospel, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Elaine, thank you for being willing. It takes a lot of courage to share. And my prayer is that many will benefit from your story. Thank so you. thank you. Me too. I'm very thankful. So. Thanks. Can we thank Elaine for sharing her story? A couple of things. Elaine will be here next week. Uh, if anybody wants to talk in private with her, she'll be out on the patio, have a conversation with her, ask her questions. There are some resources in your program today. Every week of this series, we're listing some books, uh, websites, organizations. As a church, we support Hope Women's Center uh, to walk alongside, provide resources and groups. There's a new uh, Choices Center opening up in Mesa, uh, to helping women uh, deal with and address these uh, sensitive issues. I do want to end with this. As the worship team, we'll go ahead, invite the worship team to come on up. You might have heard it said that when you come to the cross, your price is, for sin has been paid, and that is true. But I also want to address those of us who have been carrying things around for years. And maybe it's not abortion in your story. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But we all have something. We look back in our life and we regret. And that regret has led to shame. And shame is really heavy when you carry that around. For Elaine, it was 30 years she carried it around. In order to heal from it, you got to deal with it. You have to find a safe place to open up. And we've created some safe places for you. On Thursday nights, we have a group called Celebrate Recovery. We have safe environments like what Elaine referenced, Surrendering the Secret. There's information in the back there. You can grab a little brochure, Surrendering the Secret to, to, come, to, to come to Christ. And not just have your sin forgiven. That's, that's a wonderful thing. But when you come to the cross, there's this word called propitiation. You don't need to remember the word. But remember this idea. That when you come to the cross, your sins are forgiven. The price of your sin is paid. But more than that, your shame is removed. 
Does anyone walk in the room today with guilt or shame from things you've done in, over the course of your life? Yeah, me too. And when you come to the cross, Jesus says, you are forgiven. But I also remove your shame. Meaning Jesus says, when you come to him and you bring it back to, up to him, he says, I don't even know what you're talking about because he has forgotten it. Not only are you forgiven, but your sin is removed. It is no longer in the memory of God. It's in our memory because we're human and we can't forget things like God can. But I want to give you good news and hope today that not only are your sins forgiven, if there is anything that you walked into the room carrying that you've been carrying around for a long time, you don't have to leave carrying that anymore. You can give the shame to God. The cross is the perfect place of truth and mercy, justice and mercy. He doesn't ignore our sin. He pays the price for it. I'm going to pray. Would you join me in prayer? Father, I thank you for the good news that whatever we've done in our life, whatever regrets that we have in the past, God, some of us need to confess the way that we've treated people on this subject has not been pleasing to you. And so forgive us of that. And so, Father, if this is a part of our story, we ask for, for healing. If there's anything in our life that we need to bring to you and lay down at the cross, I pray that this would be the time that we would do business with you and that we would walk out of here being able to say, it is well with my soul. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve or sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this message today encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment and let us know and, and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.